I started a uh, hashtag JSIL, the Jewish state in Israel and the Levant. On Twitter, you guys should participate in it. Yeah. Those of you who were indoctrinated as youth into the um, sectarian forces of JSIL should share your heartbreaking stories. Um, those of you who might have um, served as foreign fighters in JSIL's um, sectarian militia um, should share your stories. Um, those of you who were attacked by the sectarian militia should st share your stories. JSIL continues to advance on Palestinian towns and commit horrific acts of ethnic cleansing. And people have taken to Twitter to speak out against this horrific force. We've had over 26,000 tweets on JSIL in the past week, coverage from Haaretz, the Times of Israel, Korean media, Indonesian media, New York Magazine, which said it was a mean hashtag but didn't say why. And, you know, we, I think we're, we're, we're managing to start to shape the narrative around Israel-Palestine using our own methods and our own means, and we don't really need the mainstream media. We don't need BBC, which I was unceremoniously disinvited from the other day, um, to get our message out and to frame the narrative in a way that's factual and just. I entered the Gaza Strip on August 14th at the beginning of a five-day humanitarian ceasefire, which would allow people in the Gaza Strip to continue to collect their dead who were buried under the rubble. I've been talking to some of the reporters who'd come in and out, and they were there during the ground invasion, so they saw um, some of the worst horrors. Um, many of them had been in Aleppo, and they'd been in Afghanistan, and they told me they'd never seen anything like this before. They'd never seen this scale of violence or wanton destruction or deliberate targeting of civilians. And even in Aleppo, where they saw civilians being targeted um, with barrel bombs, you know, barrel bombs are improvised explosives. They were now seeing civilians targeted with 2,000 and even 5,000 pound bunker buster bombs. I mean, and one of the families that was liquidated um, the Batch family. Um, this is the family of the head of the police in the Gaza Strip, you know, Israel. The um, JSIL are notorious cop killers. Um, and they wasted this family. They killed 19 members of an entire, one of 89 families that was completely wiped out. 89 entire lineages wiped out. Um, and a, a journalist friend of mine visited the home and told me that he found fingers in the, on the ground and saw arms dangling from the trees. Um, other friends said they would see um, lorries and donkey carts carrying charred bodies down the street in Gaza City to simply be disposed of. I didn't see death in the same, with the same intimate perspective as the other journalists. I had an advantage that the other journalists didn't have when I entered, which was that it was a five-day ceasefire, and for the first time, mm -hmm families, people in the border areas which had been flattened, according to the wishes of many Israeli politicians who were always calling for flattening Gaza, were back in their homes. They were back in the rubble of their homes and they were trying to say, you know, this was our house, this is where we're gonna stay. And some were attempting to find means of living in the rubble, um, just as a statement of their defiance. The Israelis give you a little bit of trouble for being Jewish and going into the Gaza Strip. Hamas doesn't give you any trouble. Israel does. You see, you go through and you're in this vast terminal, no one's in there, because no one can cross. And then you walk through, um, an iron door just opens. And then you walk through a long, um, you walk through like a, a long chained uh, passageway, like a, a fenced in passageway. And then there's a vast wall in front of you. And in the wall is another iron door. And the iron door opens and you walk through the iron door and you're in the walled off ghetto. You're staring at the buffer zone. You're hearing a drone over your head which will not go away for the entire time you're in the Gaza Strip. There is always a drone over your head. And to your right, perched on the wall, is a remote controlled machine gun. The remote controlled machine gun is manned or womaned um, by um, Jewish Israeli female soldiers who are in an office in the Negev desert. Most of them are around age 18 to 20. And they look for what they believe to be 
terrorists who are in the buffer zone, which used to be the most, the area where people in the Gaza Strip farm, and they look for anyone who um, walks with the gait of a terrorist. Um, they've been trained to recognize the gait of a terrorist, and then they push a button and eliminate whoever they can see with a remote controlled machine gun. You arrive at the Hamas uh, side, the Hamas customs office, which is a trailer because their other customs office had been bombed. You see tank tracks that had dug up. The uh, road and behind it is Beit Hanun, which was wiped off the face of the earth. Everything is destroyed. My fixer, who is my friend Iba Rezek, 24-year-old resident of Gaza City, a researcher and translator, picks me up. And like nearly everyone else I met, she really put on a strong posture of defiance, and that meant behaving normally with a sense of humor and looking at death and destruction without allowing it to break you. I saw very few people cry in the Gaza Strip. I saw very few people display any sorrow. And we immediately went that day to Shujaia, just east of Gaza City. It bore some of the worst violence in the earliest days of the ground invasion. The Israeli soldiers had entered and began occupying homes and didn't realize that people on the Gaza Strip not only didn't want them there, didn't want to be saved from Hamas, as Netanyahu said, but that they were prepared for them and they were prepared to resist. The al Qassam brigades are the military wing of Hamas, but they are also an indigenous fighting force from the, of the Gaza Strip comprised of people who live in Shujaia, who are neighbors and friends with the people who are being abused and killed. And they are there to defend their homes. And that is what they proceeded to do, attacking exclusively military targets, attacking Israeli soldiers who had occupied homes, um, attempting to push them out. They hit an M114 or M115 armored personnel carrier, which is a relic. It's a military relic that the U.S. used prior to um, Vietnam. So it was a very lightly armored vehicle. And they hit it with, I think, a Russian anti-tank uh, missile called the Cornet, which Hezbollah used with great effectiveness in Lebanon to end the Israeli occupation there. Um, five or to seven soldiers were killed. One uh, named Oron Shaul was um, nearly um, kidnapped, or I'm sorry, captured. Um, he was wounded. And the Israeli army invoked uh, what they, we know of as the Hannibal Directive, which is a semi-secret military policy that aims not only to kill the captors of the soldier, but even the soldier himself. Um, and it was used in Shujai as an instrument for revenge. Like, how dare you try to take one of ours? Um, um, Ta Tamar At Atash, who was a guy a little bit younger than me, I met in the rubble of his house. Um, I spoke to him in the one functioning room in the house. The rest of the house was covered with rubble. The floors were covered with glass. Um, the, his children were running along the floor and, you know, bare feet, and their feet were being... I don't know why they didn't have shoes on, but that's the situation. Their bedroom had been destroyed. Um, and the family had been spared because uh, the 500-pound dumb bomb that was, um, fell through their roof, um, fired by a U.S.-manufactured F-16, just didn't explode. The day before I had arrived to their house, the bomb had been diffused and removed from their roof. It had been lodged in their roof. So we're talking, you know, just imagine this roof with a big hole in it. That was the missile. Um, and he told me about what um, had transpired when the Hannibal Directive was invoked, that uh, they knew something had happened to a soldier, and they, had heard, they were hearing clashes outside, and the violence intensified to a massive degree, and everything was targeted. They were blanketed with Israeli munitions. Uh, those dumb bombs, 500-pound dumb bombs, even 2,000-pound bombs, missiles from drones, mortar shelling. I mean, you go into these houses and people are using spent mortar shells as ashtrays. They're just everywhere. And he told me that he started trying to rescue his neighbors. Um, he gave his shoes to a woman who had cut her feet open trying to run away. Um, young men like him began giving their shirts to other women who were having to run out of their homes um, either ha uh, half naked. Um, he had pretty much given all the clothes off his back to his neighbors as they tried to make this uh, flight. He saw his neighbors jump out of four-story windows uh, as their houses burst into flames. Electricity was out, so the 
neighbors all uh, banded together with their cell phones and formed a light um, to guide themselves towards safety. And, they, and he said he watched as one after another dropped like flies under the fire. When they fell under siege, almost the like, standard evacuation procedure for Palestinians in the Gaza Strip is the woman of the house takes a white cloth and walks out with her family, including the men behind her, to engage the Israeli soldiers because they're not military-aged men who would be immediately shot at or shot on sight or abducted. I mean, their sons were often abducted and taken to Israeli prisons. So it was also up to them to keep these entire families calm the invasion started on, in many places on Iftar. So the women were cooking for their families and all of a sudden they fell under shelling. So they were really in charge of the families. And so you hear these accounts of women waving white flags and being shot. And then they're sent on long marches uh, for two kilometers, three kilometers. And they have to lead the family to some kind of shelter. As soon as they arrived at UN shelters, those shelters were attacked. Within days of the attack on Shujaia, 20 UN shelters were deliberately targeted. In Beit Hanun, 19 people were killed when a missile struck a UN school where people were sleeping in the open in the courtyard. Later that day, I went and met the family of um, Salim Shamali. And Shamali was killed in the rubble of Shujaia looking for his family. After Shujaia was basically reduced to rubble, while Israeli soldiers were still occupying these homes. He was 22 years old. Israeli soldiers were given the latitude to enforce an invisible red line, a so-called revenge line. Anyone who crossed the invisible red line could be shot. And Shamali had apparently crossed an invisible red line. He was also wearing a green t-shirt, so perhaps he was mistaken for a fighter. Shamali wandered into the rubble, was hit once, and his hand falls to the ground, is hit again in his chest, and then the third shot kills him. You can watch the video. The video was disseminated around the world. The family of Salim Shamali saw the video. They received it in an email. I'm sitting in an apartment of one of their cousins because their home had been destroyed in Shujaia, and I had inadvertently met their relatives who had been summarily executed behind their home. One was shot um, after answering in the affirmative when soldiers asked him if he spoke Hebrew. A cousin decides to show me how much media attention Salem Shivali's death got. And that is really when the family broke. It was, I think, one of the only times I saw someone cry in the Gaza Strip. I asked Salem Shivali's 14-year-old younger brother, Wasim, uh, just to describe him for me. And he described a really social young man who was always looking out for his younger siblings, making sure that as they grew up under the siege that they had some, some fun. He'd bring them new movies, you know, the kind of things an older brother does. Wasim immediately broke down in tears. Someone put something in my hand at this point, and it was a bunch of pills. They were antidepressant pills, and one of the cousins said, this is what they've been given to deal with the death. A substantial portion of the population is addicted to tramadol, which is a really severe, highly addictive, tranquilizing drug. I said to Wasim, what do you want to be when you grow up? He said, he wants to be a fighter. He wants to join the Qassam Brigades. That's the story of the resistance in the Gaza Strip and the West Bank. That's who they are. They're orphans. They're the younger brothers of the dead. They're the older brothers of the dead. They're the children of the dead. And they're not afraid to die themselves. Um, and when he told me this, he wasn't sobbing anymore. He became resolute. I think pacifism in the situation that the people in the Gaza Strip find themselves in is a form of apathy, if not capitulation. And that's why they're never gonna put down their arms um, as long as they're under siege and they're given no other recourse and no other choice. I went to Rafa and met people who had survived another invocation of the Hannibal Directive, who had attempted to flee to shelter at the Al Najjar Hospital who had to flee that hospital after Israel threatened to bomb it. I met the lead doctor, Samir Holmes, at uh, Kuwaiti Hospital, which has 20 beds as an OBGYN and dental clinic, who had to treat the wounded and dead who were evacuated from Al Najjar, performing amputations in the hallways, on the floors, and in dental chairs, and who had to order ice cream coolers from local grocery stores to store the bodies of dead children. I saw graveyards that were bombed graveyards deliberately bombed with 2,000 pound bombs. 
Why bomb the dead? It's to destroy the memories of the living. Basha Tower fell, the oldest and most elegant residential tower in Gaza City. And what my friends who live in these residential towers, who are among the secular, educated, quasi-elite of Gaza City told me is that they're bringing these towers down to attack our memories because that was the tower that I always grew up on that was a symbol for me of our achievements and it was the home of all of the media offices of the Gaza Strip. The people in Safra 4, the 44 families who lost their homes in this residential tower in the center of Gaza City, including the head of security for Fatah, a sworn enemy of Hamas, be, um, set up a poster in front of the tower and they began signing it with messages as Americans did in front of the World Trade Center after 9-11. Um, and they said, this is our 9-11, where is the world? The world was nowhere. And the world denies not only their right to respond or retaliate, but their right of self-defense. They've been given no choice. I spent the last night that I was in the Gaza Strip um, after the ceasefire had been signed on a fishing boat. And uh, as I was waiting on the dock, I met, I, I was just hanging out waiting for the boat to disembark. And I met a young man from Shujaia who uh, had a contract to play professional football in Jordan, a pretty lucrative contract. Um, and he couldn't accept it because he had been wounded in Shujaia. Uh, his arm had been shattered and the contract was canceled. And I realized there are people standing around this port who are just here because they have nothing else to do because they have nowhere to go. Under the terms of the ceasefire, the fishermen uh, were allowed to go six nautical miles out to sea, whereas previously they were only able to go out three miles. And the big fish are beyond six miles, but this would have at least increased their catch. Um, when, we, when we got to 4.5 miles, an Israeli naval uh, ship came into view um, and began flashing uh, lights on us. And those sh ships know that there were international activists and journalists on board. What we were told was that the, fisher, the fishing crew would have pushed the limit more if we weren't on board and they would not have been fired on because we were on board. But the next time they went out, their boat would have been destroyed. They learned that this happened again and again when they brought international solidarity movement activists out so they could push the boundaries of the nautical limit and get a better catch. And that every time afterwards they were targeted, their ships were destroyed. Um, so we were sent back with a piddling catch. Um, Zakaria Bakker told me that this, ship, this, this crew lost thousands of shekels that night. Because you have to pay all of the crew members, you have to pay for gas, and you have to pay to maintain the ship. And that time after time after time, they've been losing money. And of course, we returned to a port that had been partially destroyed. Where the storerooms where they kept their nets and where they kept all of their gear, including nets that they're gonna use for the winter catch, had been targeted in an Israeli airstrike. Of course, there's no military value here. Um, in the days after, and I left the following day, um, shipping, fishing boats were attacked one crew was, uh, had, was forced to jump ship completely naked with nothing but their ID cards in their, in their mouth, in their mouths, miles at sea, and told to swim back to shore. Um, others were told to swim to the Israeli boats and they were arrested and taken to jail. Um, and this is routine and it's a clear violation of the ceasefire. I know that there's deep disappointment about the terms of the ceasefire which consolidated the status quo. And it was the US and Egypt which made sure that the ceasefire gave people in the Gaza Strip nothing. Hamas's ceasefire demands were completely reasonable. They asked for a seaport, an airport, freedom of movement uh, to be able to, to travel to Jerusalem, and for the opening of Erez and Rafa. Why can't they have that? It seems completely reasonable. The only tactic I know of that is effective and that Israel understands is BDS that we can participate in. Campaigns like the academic boycott, which is essential because so much of the Israeli military and the Israeli 
um, the whole structure of the Israeli occupation um, relies on the research and development sector that's based in Israeli universities. And you have Israeli professors uh, like Asa Kasher at Tel Aviv University writing up the rules of engagement for the Israeli military um, to enable them to target civilians. Asa Kasher, who is a professor of philosophy at Tel Aviv University, was one of the authors of the Hannibal Directive. So if you're not involved in BDS, you know, what are you, what are you waiting for? <laughs> <laughs>